a few climate differences with Australia, so I'm not <laughs> sure how relevant we'll be. <laughs> <laughs> Lake Serene. Oh, yeah. Lovely. Oh, yeah. Seward Park. Cool. Fantastic. 85 people so far. Yeah. Cool. I'm glad it's raining today, I uh, selfishly. West Seattle, good mm -hmm. luck to you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I used to live in West Seattle. I, I feel that pain. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I am uh, happy for free water from the sky because I have planted many, many, many things. <laughs> oh, Squim has sun. Of course, Squim has sun. <laughs> <laughs> My wood. are enjoying the rain. <laughs> yeah. Helping with the pollen situation, too. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, my car was yellow yesterday. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know, my windows are, so. Cool. All right, we'll give another 30 seconds here and then we'll get going. Okay. Fantastic. And if you're new to Zoom, I will explain how things work, so don't worry about that. I know that this is a brand new world for many of us. <laughs> Cool. All right, we'll get started. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, we are very excited to have you here. Um, it's kind of astounding how quickly our world has changed. <laughs> uh, this is how we used to gather. Um, where we'd all be sitting in the same room and we'd have a presenter and there would be something on the screen. And now, of course, we are not doing that. This was actually from our Orca Tech uh, talk last October for Orca Recovery Day. And now instead, it looks like this. Yeah. Um, I, I think that all of us are adjusting to um, this new world and I think we will um, figure it out over time. There is a question I'm seeing, are you muted? Yes, you are muted, so don't worry about that. Um, today we are here to talk about sustainable food gardening, and this is in partnership with King County uh, Department of Natural Resources and Parks, but specifically the Wastewater Treatment Division, and then also Snohomish Conservation District, who I work for. So my name is Kari Kwas. Uh, maybe some of you have met me at the plant sales uh, or at a fair booth or somewhere along the line. Um, this is probably how you'll be seeing me for most of this year. <laughs> we hope to get back out live again um, and be at our events because that's something that we treasure at that time, meeting the people that we work with. Today, I'm also joined by Kristen Covey, who's the Education and Engagement Coordinator for King County Wastewater Treatment Division. We also have my colleague, Joe Crumbly, who's the Urban Pro Agriculture Program Coordinator for Snohomish Conservation District. And we're also joined by Monica Vanderveren, who is the Community Relations Person for King County Wastewater Treatment Division. Um, so because you are muted and because we cannot see you, we wanted to make sure you understand how you can interact with us. So within the Zoom platform, uh, you do have the chat, which many have used, uh, used now when you put in your uh, location. We also, you can send us a message that way. You can send it just to the panelists. You can send it as to everybody so the attendees can see your question or comment too. Um, at the end of this, we are recording it, so you'll see that chat as well as the recording and audio version of it. So that way you can watch this again or share it with friends. We'll uh, get that out to you an email from Kristen next week. Then on the question and answer tab, in this case, you can ask us a question and throughout the presentation today, we're gonna do our best to either answer those questions live um, as we're going through the presentation, or we'll try and uh, pull them together, especially if there's like questions and answer them at certain parts. Also, at the end of the webinar today, we'll have probably about a half an hour uh, for after class time. So if you wanted to ask the presenters or any questions you have specifically, we'll be here for that. 
also, um, Monica and Joe have put together an immense amount of resources. And so in addition to the presentation and the chat and everything, there's going to be a whole bunch of places for you to go afterwards to look up and investigate and research on your own um, what we've talked about today. And of course, feel free to email us questions and we'll be able to help you after too. If you get really stuck, I'm your tech support, so feel free to ask questions in the chat or question and answer or email me if you really are having trouble um, beyond this and we will try and get you set up. So I wanted to start today by describing what a conservation district is because many of you may or may not know that. Um, there are 45 of them across the state of Washington and about three to 4,000 across the country. Um, they were from the federal government basically coming back to the Dust Bowl era, era and Joe will be talking about that later. Um, but our job is to work uh, voluntarily with people um, to help them on their land and protect the soil and health and air and water. Uh, there are like I said, 45 across the state. Around Puget Sound specifically, there are 12 conservation districts. So depending on where you said you were from today, you can look and see where you, your conservation district is. And there you would be covered by one of them all across the state or country. Um, in our case, I do work for Snohomish Conservation District. The district itself is based around the county line, so we encompass Snohomish County, but we also have Camano Island, which is a part of Island County. So there's kind of the logical lines based on how the land is formed and um, just the basic government there. Better Ground is our main website that any conservation district can use. It's easier to remember <laughs> than our long one. Um, so betterground.org, but you can go there and find where your conservation district is. You'll have to see that same map as well. We ourselves, like I said, we came from that Dust Bowl era in, in Snohomish Conservation District. We were started in 1941. And we had started working initially with farmers, and then that's grown over time as the landscape has changed and turned into more urban dwellers. Uh, we also work in the cities. And so we try, about half of the state is owned privately. And so we're able to work with those private landowners to get our work done. Our team is consisting of technical people, education and outreach people, our management team, finances and all of that. And I'm on the outreach and education team. And typically we would be out in the schools. We would be out at fairs. We would be giving away rain barrels. We do a lot of cool stuff. Um, right now, instead, we have changed our events calendar to be very webinar driven. Um, so in this case, we have the one today. If you live in the city of Everett, we have another one coming up on the 28th, which I'll start pushing next week. Because I know in this weird time of COVID, uh, people's attention spans are very short. <laughs> so we will get you the information as you need. We certainly want to continue our mission of getting uh, resources to you. Other programs that conservation districts do across the board are habitat restoration work. This is keeping wildlife in place like beavers. Uh, we do our native plant sale out in Monroe. You may know us from that. Uh, we have crews that work and do invasive weed removal and all kinds of wonderful projects. In the cities, again, community conservation, and this is the team that Joe is on. Um, we do rain gardens and rain barrels, and unfortunately right now everything is stopped because of the governor's orders, so we will sell rain barrels again, um, but until that order is lifted, we're unable to, our office is actually closed. We also do resource planning, and for this, this is working with a farmer. So we work with dairies and small animals. Got a sound thing. Hold on one second. Let's see. Um, we work with farmers. We work on cover crops. We basically are trying to protect the land that we work with. And we uh, developed an agricultural resilience plan for Snohomish County last year, which will be implemented in the next few years. Today we're talking about lawns to lettuce. And lawns to lettuce is really about taking your garden, your yard, and turning it into something more. Um, and Joe will go into all these kinds of details, but grass is one wonderful thing. However, it could be so much more interesting depending on uh, your land or maybe your patio. There's lots of ways that you can engage in creating habitat and growing food. 
Project Harvest uh, is also a program within our group. Last year, we were able to give several thousand pounds of food. Joe has will tell you how much, um, but that's in partnership with Volunteers of America of Washington, Western Washington, and they have their food bank. And I think a lot of people don't understand that we, as a landowners, can give um, food to the food bank, produce from our gardens, and it's a wonderful thing to um, supplement the canned food that they get typically. So we're here to help. Um, so by all means, reach out to us. Our website is snohomishcd.org. We're on all the social media platforms. And really, we're the nice guys. We're non-regulatory. We just want to make things better. So by all means, reach out to us. And now I'm going to uh, trans transition to Kristen Covey from the Brightwater Center, and she'll go over uh, the King County um, focus. All right. Okay. Thanks, Kari. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining our first attempt at this online class. Um, I'm amazed at the turnout. I think there's over 100 people here right now, um, which I guess is one of the benefits of having an online class. It's much easier to participate. Um, so again, uh, my name is Kristen Covey and I work for the King County Wastewater Treatment Division and I'm part of the education team. Um, one of my main bodies of work is to lead and teach programs out of one of our treatment plants up in Woodville called Brightwater. Um, and see here. You will see that Brightwater is located in a very peculiar spot um, it's just over the Snohomish County line which is precisely why we are partnering with the Snohomish Conservation District and have been a partner with them for many years. Um, not only do we share an interest in improving water quality, we also share community members. Um, so we've actually been offering this class as part of a series um, for the past five years at Brightwater. Um, and I know some of you in this audience have been to one of those classes or many, um, but I know that a lot of you probably haven't, um, and we would love to get to know our audience a little bit. So we're going to implement um, the polling feature on Zoom, um, which is pretty fun. So um, you should have seen something pop up on your screen to ask if you've attended one of these natural yard care classes at Brightwater before. So if you would like to, you can participate. You don't have to. Um, but yeah, go ahead and submit your answer, and we'll get the results and share them. At least Kari, I think, can share them. And you're muted, Kari. There we go. That's okay. Yeah, we're almost there. Okay. 101 people on here, so we'll give it just another minute. Okay. Okay. We'll share results. Oh, wow. Okay. So um, only 13% of you have been to one of these classes before, um, and 86 have not. Um, great. Well, welcome to all the newcomers. Um, we're glad you're here. So um, I just wanted to um, share a little bit um, briefly about our agency. Um, so this is the service area map for um, the King County Wastewater Treatment Division. Um, and you can see it's a very, very large service area. It dips right across Pierce County in the south and then stretches all the way up into Snohomish County in the north. Um, and in total, we are treating wastewater for about 1.7 million people. And that also includes 17 cities. Um, I'm gonna try to zoom in here, see if this works. Um, so you can get a better view here. Um, you'll see that we have three different treatment plants in our service area. We have one in Renton called the South Plant or South Treatment Plant servicing this yellow area. We have one in Seattle called West Point that's servicing Seattle and a couple cities up north. And then we have um, the Brightwater Treatment Plant, which is where I work, um, that's serving the Brown area. So you see that we, we get wastewater from both King County residents and Snohomish County at Brightwater. Um, and I may be a little biased, but um, I think it's pretty fun to try to find where your personal treatment plant is um, in this area if you do live in, in this region um, and come take a tour of the place where your water goes after you flush it. Um, so we do offer tours um, and we will have them in the future once these um, restrictions get lifted. So um, I'm gonna zoom out here, okay. 
So um, in total, we treat about 180 million gallons of water every day. Um, and these are aerial photos of our three plants. So you'll see bright water is here at the bottom. Um, this is our newest treatment plant. So we came online in 2011, so about nine years old. And we have um, other amenities on site besides just this treatment plant, um, including an education center. So um, this is Brightwater Center. This is where I work. This is where we normally hold these classes um, uh, for the Natural Yard Care Series. And um, this building also opened in 2011. Um, it's a beautiful space. I encourage you to come visit us in the future. Um, and we offer um, education programs for both students and adults surrounding um, improving water quality and being good water stewards. All right, and just to add on to that, um, we're all about engaging the community. Um, we offer a variety of outdoor and indoor learning experiences, including an exhibit hall, which is the top left picture, um, school field trip programs, and summer camps, which are the photos on the bottom, treatment plant tours, and of course, adult workshops like this one. Um, and in 2015, we reached out to the Snohomish Conservation District to offer sustainable landscaping classes, and we haven't looked back. Um, the Conservation District is a wonderful organization um, that provides resources um, for their community members, and we love having them as partners. And um, Based on survey feedback that we've gotten, um, we decided to add one more class to the series, which is this one. So this is actually the first time we've ever done the class, and now it's online. Um, and so people expressed an interest to learn about how to start growing food in their yard. And given the current situation, we feel like this is a very relevant topic. Um, so the Snohomish Conservation District um, have been teaching people about this topic for years. So Joe from the Conservation District will be our presenter today. Um, but we also have a representative from King County, Monica Vanderburen, um, who can answer questions and address specific um, resources that the county offers, King County offers. But she's also been a co-presenter for these classes since the very beginning and has a wealth of knowledge in general about yard care and gardening. So she's a great resource to have today. Um, so before we transition to Joe, I thought I would throw out one more polling question. I know that everybody put up earlier where they are in terms of city, but we're curious how that breaks down by county. So here is the, the county question, which county do you live in? And I realize some people aren't in Washington state, but um, you can put other. <laughs> Chris and I have a couple questions to go over too before oh, okay. we get to Joe. Well, it looks like that our, our seminar is well placed based on the numbers I'm seeing. <laughs> <laughs> One question that came through, Kristen, is what is the street cutting line near Mill Creek in the map that Brightwater serves? Oh, um, I think that is probably the um, tunnel for Brightwater. Let me go back. Wow, we have Costa Rica. What? I miss Costa Rica. Yes, hi there. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, yeah, yeah, that is. That's the tunnel yeah. alignment. Um, Brightwater discharges the effluent or the cleaned water into the Puget Sound. And so um, this is the tunnel line that the water travels in underground to get out to the sound. And it actually doesn't go right out at the sound. It goes a mile offshore and 600 and some feet deep. I was on that project, <laughs> so I know. All right, so yeah, we've got, it's almost even with Snohomish and King County, a little bit more from Snohomish County. And then, wow, Island County and 19% other. Okay, cool, great. So I will turn it over to Joe to introduce him and start the class. Yeah, and while Joe is getting his slides up, um, Joe is our contact for Lawns to Lettuce. Uh, Rain Gardens is David Jackson on our team, but in short, you can reach out to any of us through outreach at snohomishcd.org and we can help you. So. Perfect, well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Joe Crumbly 
Urban Agriculture Program Coordinator for the Snohomish Conservation District, here to talk to you today about sustainable food gardening. So in today's talk, uh, the categories we will cover today include uh, why the Conservation District cares about your garden, sustainable gardening benefits, practical information, and donating food harvests. In the 1930s, the United States was experiencing the Great Depression and devastating storms uh, across farm country. We were in a state of crisis, just like we are today. Due to drought and poor management of topsoil during the Dust Bowl, conservation districts were created to help farmers address soil conservation and food scarcity. The role of the conservation districts has changed as needs have changed. We're still focused on soil conservation, just as we were in the Dust Bowl, but we do much more now. Uh, we help people protect our waterways and continue to, to uh, work to ensure food security. Last year, we were able to uh, donate around 28,000 pounds of locally sourced fruit and produce from Snohomish County Farms to food banks and food security programs. Uh, we will continue these efforts in order to help address food security in Snohomish County and today you'll learn how you can help in these efforts. Converting your lawn to lettuce gives a better return on investment and return on environment. Lawns are really thirsty, hungry, and they eat up resources as well as money and time without giving much back. Somewhere between 30 to 50 percent of daily water use in a household may go to lawns which do not give back to your family. So now we're gonna take a brief pause and do another polling question here. Um, that'll appear on the screen shortly. And this poll will go over what are your reasons for wanting the garden? So we'll wait just a moment and see these results here. Well, there's a fair amount of folks, so this may take some time, but it won't be, won't be too long. While we're waiting, I just want to reiterate uh, my urban agriculture programs, they do find a balance of food security and natural resource conservation. So a lot of the topics I'll be talking to about today will be one or the other, or oftentimes uh, both. So just to give you an idea of what you're in, in for. Great, personal food supply is an overwhelming result uh, followed by reducing lawn and maintenance. And the rest are pretty, uh, pretty balanced. I guess improved health is another one that's, that's great to hear. Uh, so as we move through these slides, just keep in mind that all of this information uh, will be available uh, in the recording. So if you're writing notes down and you don't get everything written in time, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll have this available available for you after the presentation's over. So landowners, landowners converting their lawns to lettuce. This improves local food security and natural resource conservation. People save money and enjoy healthier yards. Uh, you'll know you're doing your part for helping with climate change. Healthy soil is the core of sustainable gardens. We will want to build soil, not lose it like we did during the Dust Bowl years. Around 10 calories of fossil fuels are used to produce and transport each calorie of food. As you can see here, growing a portion of your food, you're going to be reducing this number and we'll get into that in more detail uh, as we move along. Growing food in your garden helps you make, make sure that nothing goes into your food that you don't know about. Locally sourced food will not need preservatives to keep looking fresh, contributing to consumer health. Unfortunately, around 70% uh, of all food uh, produced in the U.S. and uh, sold is processed. So that being said, sustainable gardens are a great source of food, and you can make sure that your garden is safe for people, pets, and wildlife. Using natural yard care and pest control practices means your garden food will be pesticide free. Supporting local agriculture and preserving farmland is vital due to Snohomish County being the fastest growing county in Washington. When housing encroaches on farmland, it's important to find a balance and connect people to where their food comes from. 
This is where some of our programs come into play. Uh, your home and community gardens can help your food dollars go further. In times like these, when the food supply can be affected by disruptions due to supply chains, you can feed yourself and your family, as well as your community. Uh, so there are a few basics you'll need to know uh, to get started with a home garden. We're going to talk through all these topics, starting with site selection. This is another slide where we're going to have a polling question that will pop up momentarily. Uh, this will eventually say, do you garden on the, um, give you a couple options here as you can see. So we'll wait a moment while these are submitted. And I'm really curious to see uh, what kind of environment folks are, are gardening in. And if you put other, you can always type um, your specific response um, in the messaging as well. I'm sure it won't be too much longer. Let's see, oh wow, large yard. Nice, so that's a, the overwhelming respondents, 52% uh, large yard, followed by small yard, patio, balcony, and other. Uh, so we do offer some ideas for all kinds of options that you have to work with. Um, and any of these are, are great, how little or, or large. So keeping in mind uh, some aspects of site selection, any spot that receives eight hours of direct sunlight is um, important to consider. But that being said, leafy greens and root vegetables do not require quite as much. Um, of course, when you're considering site selection, you're probably going to want to prioritize an area that will give you more options in case you want to diversify uh, the plant selection later on. Uh, in this process, when you're considering the ideal site, you're going to want to make sure and know where all your utilities are located before you start your garden project. Uh, so if you're going to dig down, be sure and call 811. I know that we have a fair amount of folks not in this specific area, so that number may change depending on your location, but at least for this Western Washington area, that's the number to call. As you can see in this yard, uh, there's a drain. There may be other hidden utilities underground, which is really important why you call that number. Uh, it's gonna save you time, it's gonna save you money. So this is kind of the blank slate of where uh, some garden beds can go. Um, and here's a before picture. Uh, and of course, we're gonna show you some after pictures in uh, just a moment. So in the installation category, we're gonna give you a couple options on replacing your lawn. The first one is digging up sod and amending soil. It's one effective option, but it is also a labor intensive option. Here's a before and after picture here. Um, there's all kinds of practices that we're uh, promoting emphasized in this picture, one of which that we'll get into more detail in just a moment is uh, sheet mulching. So hey, no-till gardening. What's so up? I have a question for you. Sorry to break in there. Sure, sure. Someone was um, asking, how do you figure out how many hours of sunshine a spot gets? Do you know, or Monica? Yeah, Monica, feel free to chime in if you have an answer. I would uh, just take a look at your yard and see what kind of shadows are um, falling across your lawn throughout the day. Um, you could even set up a time-lapse camera if you have one of those. Um, but just kind of, in my opinion, you know, just observing it, uh, nothing too fancy. Yeah, I think you can make a general observation. And that's a rule of thumb. As Joe said, some plants can do well without that eight hours of sunlight. Um, any of our Pacific Northwest gardeners will know that you can grow stuff in the fall and then even in the winter, if your um, site is warm enough, you can get kale and things like that that will grow. Um, so we'll talk about how, we've got some people from far away, I see Florida. Um, so we'll talk about how you find your planting zone and then that can help you determine what plants will grow in that zone. Exactly, exactly. Thanks. Uh, so again, no-till gardening, this is a less intensive uh, uh, labor option. Um, it contributes to soil health and it increases beneficial insects and microbes. 
So sheet mulching is a great option to replace your lawn. Um, it reduces weeds, increases nutrient and water retention. It also effectively gets rid of grass, reducing erosion and stormwater overflow into nearby waterways. Here's a great diagram of uh, one method of going about sheet mulching. So the Department of Ecology uh, has a website called Dirt Alert, where you can check your area for soil contaminants. Uh, this is uh, the Department of Ecology for the state of Washington. I would imagine that they have other states as well that you can check a similar resource. Um, but this specifically can show you parts of Western Washington and I see Eastern Washington as well, where there's some listed uh, soil contamination. They even have some other um, charts that they can break down even more intricately where you're located and the level of possible contamination. Joe? Yeah. Um, can I step in? Um, for I use a lot of the no-till methods because I am that lazy gardener and I'm on nine acres. Um, and the thing I can recommend, which is also sustainable, is check with local resources for things like cardboard. So not cardboard with shiny colored outsides, um, but just plain cardboard. Things like that, if you can lay them down and put mulch over them, they will eventually get worked into your soil. You'll find a lot of insects and even garter snakes like to uh, live underneath them. And uh, they'll end up enriching your soil. But I have reed canary grass. I'm not sure if anybody else does. And they, I have effectively choked out reed canary grass, which is super tough with cardboard and mulch. So I can highly recommend it and you can get materials elsewhere, but don't go with like really thin cover because you need to like, sun is, is the um, thing that these plants need. So you need to block the sun out and make sure they can't creep outside of it. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, you know, as, it, as the cardboard breaks down, it can add some nutrients to the soil and in the process it also prevents uh, weeds from popping up as well. So there's all kinds of great aspects of uh, emphasizing that practice. And, and I see a, a lot of people are adding sources of cardboard in the chat. So that's super great and we'll, um, you'll see those afterward. Perfect. And Joe, I have a couple questions too before we move on. Sure, uh, sure. There was one about why do you uh, do this 10 feet from the house? Uh, the comment was roots for veg vegetables aren't usually that deep, are they? Are there other considerations? Was that referring to sheet mulching or which uh, slide was that? I think going back to where you would actually place your vegetable garden, why would you do it more than 10 feet from the house? Sure. Um, so in general, and we can we can follow through with you in more detail uh, through email later on, but basically um, a lot of times you're going to keep in mind when you're implementing rain gardens, when you're implementing any kind of garden, you want to consider what kind of drainage is going to affect, potentially affect the foundation of the house. And so whenever that's a potential issue, you just want to play it safe. Um, there's all kinds of variables that uh, that could affect the, the foundation. And Monica, do you have any input for that as well? Yeah, the other thing is, is that you also want to give yourself space to maintain your home, right? So especially if you have to put up scaffolding or ladders to get on the roof or to get to gutters to clean them out. So you want to give your house, as Joe said, some breathing space so you're not watering close to the foundation, but you're also going to want to give yourself some space to maintain your home. Um, the other thing to remember is that gardens, as much as we love them, can attract pests. And the closer any landscaping is to your house, the easier it is for uh, critters to get into your house, which none of us want right now. Yeah, and another thing I would add as well is, um, you know, we mentioned the eight hours of direct sun. And of course, the closer you are to the house, the more shadows your, your um, house is going to give off onto the garden space as well. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so if you have heavy clay soils or really tough conditions, uh, raised beds with fresh soil you can bring in can save a lot of work. Uh, raised beds, when you have poor drainage that can drown some plants, you want to avoid this, um, you know, if your dog runs through the yard, if you have rabbits or uh, different pests wandering around. Uh, it can be easier to protect your garden with raised garden beds. They're aesthetically pleasing and they can lay down cardboard or weed around uh, the beds or underneath weed guard. Um, 
you can avoid digging up grass. As you see here, this is a good example of emphasizing raised beds and sheet mulching at the same time. A lot of times, um, you know, the weeds that are going to be in the top of the raised beds are either going to be from bird droppings or from weeds germinating around the perimeter of the raised bed, but very unlikely to be coming up from under the raised bed based on the preventative layers underneath. Uh, so the more that you can prevent weeds from germinating around the perimeter, uh, the better. Uh, again, due to the raised beds being so heavy uh, when they're filled, you're going to want to make sure and place them somewhere which receives at least eight hours of direct sun. Uh, also, this aspect you can see on the screen, planting north to south, um, that prevents plants from shading each other as well. So we'll provide detailed raised garden bed building instructions um, in our resources sent to today's attendees, but this is just a brief glimpse of some of the um, the general supplies that you might need if you're going to go about the, the route of building it out of wood. Uh, typically coniferous or evergreen wood um, breaks down slower, it's a little more acidic, and so therefore you're going to want to have it uh, utilize that rather than a deciduous wood uh, because it will have a longer lifespan. So for the following containers that we're going to show you, you're going to want to choose some shallow root system vegetables like lettuce or herbs due to the shallower depth of the soil um, in these options. Using these methods can also uh, prevent used materials from entering the waste stream as you see here, a couple two liter bottles, some red cups. Uh, these are great ways to go about uh, reusing these materials rather than throwing them out. So you can see this hay bale setup is pretty interesting. It also has a drip irrigation um, set up on it as well. We'll dive into that a little more in just a moment. And here's a PVC vegetable tower. A uh, local Boys and Girls Club that we work with uses this uh, kind of setup for educational workshops. It's great um, for just showing a, a little bit of variety and um, you know, a great way to utilize PVC uh, piping as well. So do you want to grow in limited space? There were some great options here. Again, this PowerPoint will be available after the fact, so you can always look back at it for uh, these ideas. And Joe, um, we'll send out some resources that will be local. You can get a lot of materials that are left over from construction, like untreated wood that's lagging wood or building materials. And you actually, um, so even if you don't have them on, on hand, you actually are helping to divert from the waste stream, like who needs more landfills, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we have things like second use building supply and some other resources we'll send out. If you aren't in our area, because it's lovely that we have people from all over, you might want to Google some of those resources to see what you can get. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. And in general, um, I try and, again, find a wood that's not pressure treated, wood that doesn't have paint or, or varnish or any finish on it as well. Joe, can I add one more thing? Because somebody made a point about hardware fabric and we had another question about soil. Sure. Um, so what the dirt alert uh, warning came in because we have in our area, um, we have had old arsenic smelters that have, um, that have distributed through the air some amount of arsenic and lead that's in the soil. The other problem you can have, and this happened worldwide from the 1880s to the 1930s, is apple orchards. They used mm -hmm. uh, lead, arsenic, lead arsenate slurry, which then got replaced with DDT to take care of cobbling moth, which affected apples. Yeah. So there, these really are historic issues. If you are on old farmland where they used a lot of pesticide, that can be an issue as well. And Joe's going to talk more about soil tests, but my advice if you are keeping your bottom open on a raised bed is to be conservative about, because you may end up turning that bottom soil and get your soil tested. Um, and then, yes, put chicken wire, hardware cloth, or something on the bottom if you have digging creatures, especially for shallow rooted plants. And you, if you have a shallow raised bed, you can get stuff that will literally come up from underneath and grab your plants from the root down. 
um, and just kind of pull them underground and eat them. So, so that's a good suggestion and thank you from, from Kathleen. Yeah, no, that's a great point. That's a really great point. Uh, so now getting into soil tests a little more, um, getting to know your soil and taking soil samples are important aspects of site selection. You're gonna to wanna to have great soil to support healthy plants and reduce your water use. Each year, Snohomish Conservation District gives a presentation on soil mulch and soil health in partnership with King County and Brightwater, which you will all have access to uh, in a follow-up email with our uh, remaining resources. Uh, so a soil test can measure uh, soil fertility. You can also measure some of the things you see on the screen, pH, salts, organic matter, nutrients, as well as contaminants that we had just mentioned. Results ob obtained from soil tests include nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, otherwise known as NPK. Um, it's also broken down into these three categories, uh, primary, secondary, and micronutrients. We also have soil testing information available on our website. Snohomish Conservation Districts offers this resource to commercial farmers and King Conservation District will test soil for free uh, for homeowners as well. Compost is an organic matter that increases nutrient and water retention in soil and reduces the need for fertilizers and pesticides. Again, it goes back to that uh, aspect of helping beneficial insects, which in turn will reduce the pests in your garden area. So there's many benefits to composting, including nutrient and water retention and reducing stormwater runoff. We have a composting presentation as well that I, I had mentioned, and that provides more detailed information um, available in the resources we'll send out. That will provide more details about different composting methods, different containers, and just different options available for you. So we'll make sure to, that you have access to that resource. Hey, Joe. Yeah. Couple questions. One of yeah. uh, are ants beneficial, which I think is a good question. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that depends. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, in general, ants, spiders, things like that are, are not going to be harmful. Um, it it kind of matters on the circumstance. Um, around here, we don't have too much of an ant problem. Uh, one, one interesting fact I've heard is that if ants didn't exist, there would be a, a, a large layer of duff uh, on the surface of the earth or of uh, organic plant matter. So they actually do, um, in some cases, take away some of like the stuff that you would want for compost. So I guess in that sense, they're kind of cleaning up an area which you may not want. Um, but in general, I would assume that ants wouldn't be detrimental to most plants. Mona, could you have any uh, additions to that? Uh, actually, believe it or not, ants help distribute plants as well. We have a lot of native plants like our bleeding heart and trilliums that are actually distributed by ants. Ants are really an important food source for birds mm. as well. Um, so you see a lot of these uh, ground feeding birds and they are scratching around and they are looking for insects. So again, you'll want to be, our houses are kind of an artificial structure in nature. So you want to be careful about gardening around your house for precisely that reason. Um, that being said, we do have in sp invasive species of ants. So you'll want to watch for that because that is an issue. Um, but in general, uh, really looking at insects and, and having a complement of insects, most of insects are beneficial to the environment and they actually control insects that aren't. So that would be my input on that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, of course, there's going to be uh, varieties here or there that may, uh, may not fall under that category. But in general, I would say that, yeah, the the more that you can reduce uh, any pesticides to get rid of things like that, you know, we really try and, and stay away from, from utilizing uh, chemicals to get rid of, of ants and, and things like that. So I agree. Thanks, Joe. One of yeah. the other things, another question that came up, uh, people are concerned about having shady yards and um, can they grow vegetables in their shade? Yeah, and again, um, 
you know, some of the vegetable varieties that require a lot less sun are going to be leafy greens and root vegetables. And this is specifically in the area that we work in in Snohomish County. But you can think about, uh, you know, kale, uh, lettuce, um, collards, um, Swiss chard. You can think about beets, radishes. So there's a lot of variety that you can choose from in that category. But again, you may ch change your mind later on and decide that you're going to want a larger variety of vegetables that require more sun. So whenever planning a garden space, it's always best to choose somewhere sunny if possible in case you decide to have more options later on. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, so another practice, <clears throat> excuse me, another practice we promote is rainwater catchment. We also have a Watering Wisely yearly talk as well, which we will be able to send uh, you follow-up information on. So we're just gonna dive into this category briefly and, and touch on it. Uh, so we regularly work with people installing rain barrels, totes, and cisterns, and connecting them to irrigation uh, for gardens. Hand watering is also great as well. Um, so we can purchase these online at snohomishcd.org. Although, as we mentioned earlier, uh, due to the statewide shutdown, this will be postponed until that ban has been lifted. Here's an example of a large catchment uh, volume for a large garden. Uh, typically, totes and cisterns are better suited for farms, while rain barrels are better, better suited for individual homeowners. So as you can see in the back here, these are two totes stacked on top of each other. They get quite heavy when they're filled, so you want to make sure that you have a flat base on there. Um, and there's a drip irrigation that you can kind of see here coming from those. Um, typically, if you're going to utilize rain barrels, you would want them to be elevated at least two feet off the ground, uh, usually with cement blocks. And uh, you probably don't want your garden to be too far away. I typically stay around 10 feet or so away from uh, the rain barrels to make sure it has enough pressure from uh, the two foot elevation. And uh, Joe, can I add, we will provide the audience with some uh, resources on using uh, rainwater catchment on edible food gardens. Um, so that you can look at what the pluses and minuses are depending on what your roof is. So we'll get you some resources so you can assess what your situation is. For anybody who lives in Seattle, you can go to the 12,000 Rain Gardens or Residential RainWise page. We have a lot of information on um, rainwater catchment and King County offers a program where we actually have put in cisterns. What we're trying to do, or the wastewater treatment uh, division, we're trying to keep stormwater out of the sewer system. So we do partner in the city of Seattle to provide people with cisterns and depending on what your situation is, you may be able to use that rainwater for your plants. We actually have an artist who uses that rainwater. He does pottery and he swears that it's better than tap water because it doesn't have um, bleach and things like that that we use to process tap water. So, so there are some options there. Oh, interesting. Nice, that's good to know. And so another um, uh, recommendation for irrigation systems is to water from the roots up uh, using micro irrigation, otherwise known as uh, drip irrigation, directly into the soil. Uh, it's much more efficient. Around half of all surface water can be lost to evaporation, believe it or not. And another recommendation is for a typical 5 8 inch hose, you will want to most likely need around 200 minutes to saturate a garden with one inch of water. And it may require around two inches per week. So now we're gonna discuss what plants well, work well in uh, your environment. And here's another polling question that'll pop up shortly. So this is a, a question that you may not know the answer to right away. Um, don't worry, we're gonna get into it in just a moment. Uh, but this is another aspect of uh, site selection that you're gonna wanna consider when choosing what kind of plants may work well. And Joe, can you repeat uh, uh, for one of the attendees the figure on 200 minutes of watering? Oh, sure. Sure. So again, um, for using a typical 5 8 inch hose, 
you're going to most likely need around 200 minutes to saturate a garden with one inch of water. Uh, so, uh, you know, just in general, on average, it may require around two inches per week. And here we have the results. Uh, wow, it looks like the majority of folks do know what planning zone they're in. That's great. You're ahead of the game. And uh, for those of you who are not sure, um, we'll be able to get into the specifics of how to find that out in just a moment. Joe, we have a question. Can you plant shallow root veggies in a septic drain field? Uh, you know, that's, it, it depends. I would, I always kind of recommend folks to stay away from that. Um, and I know you probably do as well, just because there's so many things that can go wrong. Um, you know, it's, it's just a safe bet to stay away from planting in septic drain fields. And there's safety precautions. Um, there's also issues of maybe affecting the efficiency of the septic. So I would just play it safe and, and not do that. Would you concur? I totally agree. I generally, um, because your drain field can fail for a number of reasons, and uh, we're we're the wastewater treatment division. We're in the poop business. Um, yeah. I, you know, there is such a thing as night soil. They use, and we actually have compost made from our biosolids, but it goes through a pretty rigorous process and uh, testing to make sure it's pathogen free. Mm -hmm. And you can't guarantee that when you're looking at a septic drain field. Um, I found my old septic drain field because I had a spare uh, sequoia. They're the giant sequoias that grow a million feet tall. And I put mm -hmm. it on what turned out to be the old septic drain field. And within a year, it went from six inches to six feet tall. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, so you can have leaching and basically that is human waste. So I would highly recommend against it. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so now we're going to cover planting zone site selection and different options for your location, uh, how you can start with seeds, starts. So uh, some resources on planting zones can be found through the USDA website, which we'll list in our resources page. Uh, this determines which plants grow well in your area based on temperature through different parts of the year. It's a really great uh, website and it can save you a lot of time and, and help with your planning. So vegetable varieties, uh, they require varying levels of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, again known as N, P, and K, as well as different levels of sunlight and moisture. A fun activity to do at home and also reduce food waste is to propagate the base of a green onion root in uh, water for a couple days, uh, changing the water daily. This is a good way to reuse this plant base that would otherwise um, be thrown away. After the green onion roots uh, grow a little bit, um, grow a little bit longer, you can transplant them in a pot with soil on the windowsill or directly outside. Um, based on our climate in our area of uh, King and Snohomish County, you're going to probably want to wait until around mid-May before planting them outside. And this can uh, happen with a couple other vegetables as well, including celery and romaine lettuce. Of course, depending on your planting zone. Uh, so. If your potatoes turn green and get eyes or start to sprout, uh, you can plant them in a barrel and grow potatoes instead of throwing them out. Um, so a lot of times folks will think that uh, growing potatoes has to take place in, in a large field and you have to mound the rows and it, um, it really can take place on a small scale as well using a barrel, which is great. Another fun activity um, to do indoors for all ages uh, is using old egg cartons on a windowsill and using a little bit of soil and, and seeds and just experimenting how that goes. Um, it does depend on the seed variety. Some seeds in the back of the packet will say uh, you want to plant directly in the soil outside. Some say that you can ger germinate them indoors. So it does depend on the seed, um, but it's a great way to reuse uh, old egg cartons as well. So here's an after picture of uh, implementing uh, raised garden beds and sheet mulching. 
So now that you have your garden uh, set up and planted, you'll want to manage it, keeping the weeds down, watering and controlling pests. Uh, the best part comes, of course, when it's harvest time, when you can glean food for yourself and others. This is also going to be our next polling question that'll pop up on the screen momentarily. Uh, this is going to say, uh, would you donate more to food banks if transporting the food was provided, if help with that was provided? We'll know in just a moment, and this is also a good precursor to uh, some of our upcoming slides talking about local food security programs and gleaning events, uh, harvesting from local farms for, for food banks. And Joe, while we're waiting for those to come in, there's a question about where's the best place to order seeds um, for our region online? Hmm, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, for us, uh, I'm actually not allowed at working for a state agency to promote any specific company. Um, but of course, I'm going to try and stay with uh, organic as much as I can. I know that's not in the budget for everyone. Um, I will say that even if it's not organic, it's oftentimes non-GMO. And so there's different ways to, uh, to look into cheap seeds that may not be organic, but still could be good, good options. Uh, and of course, starting from seed rather than purchasing from a vegetable start is going to save you a lot of money. Even if not 100% of the seeds uh, have a, a success, you're still going to save a fair amount of money. So it really depends on your region. Um, if you want to send us a follow-up email, I would be happy to look into options for you based on where you're located as well. That's great, Joe. And if um, attendees want to put into the chat places where they've gotten seeds and had success, feel free to do that. And I just want to say hi to Maya. We have a 12 year old on our call today. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> um, um, and then the other thing you can watch for, um, I'm in Snohomish. I know we've got at least a couple people from Snohomish on, um, like Master Gardeners sometimes have start sales and um, the 4-H groups from schools will have plant starts, vegetable starts that will work in your area. And the nice thing about going to those when you can go to them live, which we can't right now, is that um, they are economical. You're supporting education and nonprofits. And then the other thing is, is that you have gardeners there to give you advice. So um, it, especially right in your area, it's super helpful to have people to say, oh, here's what my experience is, and you might get this pest, and here's a great way to control it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's a great point, and it reminds me that uh, in Snohomish County, there's also something called seed swaps that can oftentimes take place at local libraries. Um, once the state uh, uh, shutdown on going outside has been lifted, in large groups, then we can resume putting those kinds of events on our events calendar page on our SCD uh, website as well. So there's seed swaps. There's also uh, eventually from time to time free farmers markets where folks will bring uh, produce and exchange that as well. So it's a really fun way to get to know your neighbors uh, in the future. And uh, we'll make sure to post those once those events become available. I just want to quickly say that uh, we have some more questions in the chat, um, but I will we'll ask those at the end so Joe, Joe can get through his slides because I think some of uh, your questions will be answered shortly. Oh, perfect. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan. Um, and it looks like not a factor as far as transportation goes, so that's good to know, but there is a significant amount that say yes if transportation was provided. So uh, our 2020 urban agriculture programs are somewhat up in the air depending on what uh, ends up happening with uh, all these uh, public health concerns, um, but we are intending to eventually resume our gleaning events and we would ideally like to help increase the number of uh, fruit, the amount of fruit and produce donated to local food banks. So that's great to know. So managing your yard does not have to mean chemical warfare. As we mentioned, uh, there's all kinds of uh, aspects you can implement in your yard to reduce pesticide and herbicide use. Companion planting uh, is one to replenish nutrients in the soil, allowing one plant to give back what another takes away, such as corn, beans, and squash. I've heard this referred to before as the three sisters. Uh, depending on your region, there's all kinds of other 
companion planting options available for you. Um, there's some ways to control pests without using synthetic chemicals, including beneficial bugs, which control other bug populations that may be pests. Uh, sometimes you can just let nature take its course. Uh, as you can see here on the screen, the moth laying eggs, uh, this won't kill the zucchini. Um, you'll still have plenty of zucchini. It's one of those vegetables that just keeps on producing. And it's actually an interesting fact as well that uh, certain plants that have leaves partially eaten will have more nutrients in them because the plant has to work harder to keep going. Another thing that we promote is supporting pollinators. So increasing pollinator habitat can also increase the yield of fruit and vegetable production. Uh, you can help let nature help you by encouraging wildlife in your garden. Owls, hawks, and other birds will hunt rodents. Many birds use insects to feed their young uh, and beneficial insects like dragonflies and wasps prey on other uh, bugs and pests that we don't like. So again, some maintenance aspects that you wanna keep in mind, uh, frequent soil tests, organic matter, slow release fertilizer, and compost can increase soil health. Uh, drip irrigation and sheet mulching can also reduce maintenance. Of course, the drip irrigation lowers the amount that you'll have to water. You can even purchase timers attached to the drip irrigation so you don't have to think about it. And of course, sheet mulching can help reduce the maintenance for weeding. So plan on harvesting or donating what you don't use. Um, as you can see here in this sign, sometimes uh, apple orchards or uh, different folks that have fruit trees will put out signs and, you know, contacting the local conservation district, conservation district, odds are they're going to have a gleaning program that uh, may be able to help you out. So for folks who are interested in participating in uh, one of our urban agriculture programs, Plant a Row, uh, signs are available for certain participants and vegetable seeds are available uh, as well. Um, for individual homeowners, you're going to, once the lockdown, statewide lockdown is uh, lifted, um, you can come pick up vegetable seeds. You'll just want to contact us ahead of time and we'll be able to let you know what seed variety we have available. Uh, so uh, like I said, we provide free vegetable seeds to people willing to donate part of what they grow or a, a row of what they grow to food banks in Snohomish County. Um, as you can see, our website lists all the different participating food banks. I think it's around 20 or 21 different food banks that are willing to accept uh, fruit or produce donated from this program. Through our collaboration with the Future Farmers of America, otherwise known as FFA, and Monroe High School last year in 2019, we, and I will say also with the help of uh, other local farmers, uh, we were able to grow around 13,500 vegetable starts distributed across Snohomish County to underserved communities. So this included things like uh, food banks that have on-site community gardens. Uh, it can, can include, um, you know, nonprofit organizations like, I don't know if a lot of you may know, but Housing Hope is one where it helps folks get back on their feet from homelessness. Um, that was an, a great organization where we helped multiple sites. And at that location, it not only uh, helped increase food security, but also added a, a beneficial therapeutic aspect for folks. Um, so we work with, uh, you know, boys and girls clubs, YWCAs, all kinds of nonprofits that are helping folks um, that are maybe facing food insecurity. Our website also has a video on how to grow and donate fruit and produce. Um, so we have all kinds of resources, like I said, we're going to send to you later on. Uh, and if you want to check out our website, snohomishcd.org. Uh, we have a drop down menu for programs where there's uh, our lawns to lettuce program our plant to row program talks about our gleaning uh, with project harvest uh, in partnership with the volunteers of america um, so all kinds of great uh, urban agriculture programs with more information on our website as well so last year uh, we don't we distributed 88 raised garden beds um, in 2019 from used lumber which have would otherwise have been sent to the landfill um, the picture on the right is another neat story from a local food bank garden where the nearby senior center in that cul-de-sac used the lettuce uh, in their weekly salad bar available. Um, this was also in an area 
uh, with a boys and girls club, a um, child care, and it was a great way to bring together the local community. And Joe, are the boxes on the right the uh, pine boxes that come from Boeing? Um, I think they are pine. They didn't come from Boeing. They came from a actually a uh, well, first off, the, the boxes on the left were made from refurbished lumber for construction sites. The boxes on the right were pre-built. Um, they were actually used from a local furniture company that uh, found it to be cheaper to donate the boxes that were used to ship furniture rather than to send them to a landfill. So oftentimes, you know, you can find a great situation where you're saving things from uh, resources from being wasted. And, and it kind of goes hand in hand with our gleaning program, you know, for um, for farmers, their bottom line can sometimes be so thin that at a certain point they may still have fruit or produce on the field that they want to send to market, but it's not financially feasible with them based on the cost of labor. And so that's when they give us a call. They let us know that, hey, we can bring out our volunteers and uh, allocate that resource to local food security programs. So it's a great way with garden beds, with extra fruit to find a niche in the system where you can still utilize those resources and prevent them from going to waste. Uh, here's another example of how someone changed their lawn into a space for growing food. Uh, this one is in uh, Snohomish County. It's actually right on the water. Uh, great property here and you can see that they reduced their lawn um, to a space for growing food for food banks uh, using some of our donated seeds and, and supplies. Uh, so we also offer hands-on community garden workshops in which can engage the whole family. Uh, during one of our previous garden workshops, planting seeds and starts, one of the young children let her parents know that they were having more fun than their recent birthday party, which uh, was good news in a way and kind of an uplifting story. Uh, so we sell pollinator seeds as well, as we mentioned, that uh, increasing pollinator habitat um, is great for the local ecosystem, but it can also increase the yield of fruit and vegetable production. Uh, you can see on the back of our pollinator packet there, around 19 or 20 different uh, native plant and, or native uh, grass and wildflower varieties. Of course, this would change depending on your location. I, not, I know that not everyone uh, looking in here is uh, located in Snohomish County, so odds are a lot of those varieties may change for you. In 2019, we also distributed around 123 different rain barrels, which to amount, amounts to around 15,675 gallons um, stored for later use. We live in a state in Washington, luckily enough, where we can legally harvest rainwater. Um, and this is also important because it reduces uh, stormwater overflow, reduces uh, erosion from storm surges, and uh, it's just a great way to save money and uh, lower the maintenance. And Joe, if I could add something from a utility standpoint, um, everybody's water source comes from someplace different. We're lucky ours comes from the mountains, but it takes a lot of infrastructure and energy to get drinking water to your house. So if you can use your rainwater, you are actually, it's kind of a double savings because you aren't actually running water through a whole treatment system before it comes out of your spigot and onto your plants, right? Mm -hmm. It just falls from the sky and then you gather it for your yard. So there's a huge savings there in infrastructure and energy. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the more practices like this that you utilize, you can become closer to having a kind of a closed loop system in your, in your garden space and lowering that environmental footprint. Uh, so we also have a manure share program. We work with local horse farms when they have an excess of aged horse manure. Uh, they can let us know and we can then help um, let this be known to uh, the public in our area. Um, this is also something that will have a lot more detail in our other uh, soil health and composting um, PowerPoint. If you want to have access to that, that'll be in our resources. Um, so here's our last polling question for the day. Um, uh, this will also pop up on your screen momentarily, and it can ask you a little bit about what your interests are and what your maybe your priorities are. Of 
course, uh, while we're waiting, I just want to reiterate that our programs find a balance between food security and natural resource conservation. And oftentimes, uh, there's a lot of overlap with both of those. Sure, there's a lot of folks voting, so we'll know. Okay, installing rain barrels, nice. Well, that's great to know. Um, we are looking to, uh, you know, sell the, our rain barrels again later this year once the statewide shutdown has um, been lifted, and uh, we really are trying to ramp up our our stormwater catchment and uh, rainwater catchment program. So that's great to know. There's such a high interest in that. So I just want to say thanks again to everyone. Uh, for listening in. This was uh, something that we were rolling out new and we're really happy that it went somewhat smoothly. Uh, feel free to reach out to me through the email here if you have any questions or to any of our other presenters. Um, and if you have any questions about our programs, please let us know or any of the resources that we mentioned. We're more than happy to uh, provide more educational information and uh, we really appreciate your time today. Kari, do you have anything to say to wrap it up? I know we're going to have some sort of uh, um, final word here. Oh, I definitely, we have a lot of questions still, so I want to cover yeah. those. Perfect. The right screen. Joe, the easy one is how much are the rain barrels? Oh, sure. Um, so like I said, they're not being sold at this time. Uh, last time they were sold, uh, they were around $50. Per yeah. barrel. I don't know if that has changed because I know that we were changing suppliers recently. Um, so don't quote me on that exact amount, but it should be approximately $50 a barrel. Yep. Uh, I also know that we sell totes as well, but those are a little harder to come by. So the wait list is a little bit longer. Um, I know that for the totes, they hold around triple the amount of a rain barrel. Yeah, we sell them at cost, so it's about 50 bucks a barrel. You can find them on our website and uh, it's nahomishcd.org. And again, once the governor's order is lifted, we will be selling those again. So I have a couple hey, uh, of questions. Kari and Joe, do you still have the instructions on your web for painting? Yeah, we do. There's a whole uh, rain barrel uh, maintenance page that has how you paint, how you have to you scratch the surface first before you put on the primer and you can make them pretty. They don't have to be blue. Um, right. And <laughs> there's a lot of different instructions, how to install. We have a lot of videos on our website too. And I, I will say as well that, um, you know, part of the maintenance uh, for rain barrels is cleaning out the algae, algae buildup in them. And that's why we choose to sell ones that are blue. If you end up finding one that is uh, more see-through or translucent, you would definitely want to paint it um, to make sure that less sunlight gets in there because the more sunlight, the more algae is going to be produced. That's true. Yeah, the painting for some people, um, it, the blue stands out. And so it's not necessary with these, but they have some phenomenal examples of cool art on the Conservation District website. So you'll want to check those out. And for all of those people asking questions about rain barrels, I, I do suggest going to our website um, and just type in rain barrels into the search. You're going to find a lot of information. I'm seeing things about downspout diverters and I'm seeing about the wanting of a workshop for using gray water so we can think about covering that too. Mm -hmm. um, also coming back to the raised beds, Joe and Monica, there's some questions about um, what do you do if your seeds start to rot? And then the other one is about uh, untreated wood being used in the uh, raised beds. Sure. Um... So I would say, you know, if your seeds are rotting, you, you don't want to be using those, obviously, but it also goes to uh, your soil quality. It sounds like you may have mm -hmm. too dense of soil and you're going to want to add some uh, natural soil amendment in there to increase aeration, um, which in turn increases, you know, beneficial insects and microbes. But it sounds to me like your soil might be a little dense and that you want to reduce mm -hmm. that um, by increasing the airflow and circulation in the soil. Uh, Monica, do you have anything to say? I, I would just confirm that. So I get soil from two different sources and one has a little bit more clay in it. So I literally use um, one type of soil for plants that I know like wet feet. 
and then I use the other soil for things that I know are going to rot in it. So it is definitely soil quality based and also drainage based. So um, what you also may need to do is make sure if you've got holes in the bottom of something that they haven't plugged, right? So that stuff can't drain out. Um, Cause that's usually what's happening is you've got a drainage issue. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, as far as the, the lumber question goes, Kari, can you say that one more time? I think you mentioned uh, they were concerned if they're using untreated lumber or treated lumber. I would, of course, yeah, say untreated. go with the untreated. Is that what they were asking? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and it's just, it's just because you want to play it safe again. I know there's a, co a couple un or conflicting studies that mm -hmm. say one or the other, but just playing it safe, not knowing what kind of chemicals are, are used in that um, lumber treating process. Uh, of course, the treated lumber is going to last longer, but you don't want to risk your health for a longer lasting raised bed. It's not worth it. And, and um, you know, I, I will also say on our website, we have interesting information about a practice called Hugel culture. It's a practice that's been uh, around for quite some time. And it's also, uh, we get into that in more in depth in our soil presentation. Um, and that basically talks about burying certain uh, woody debris in garden beds to release uh, nutrients over time. I won't get in too in depth with that, but uh, you're gonna make sure and, and wanna look into that uh, presentation for more information about that because there are certain woods to avoid when practicing Google culture as well. The other thing in our area, um, I'm big on reuse on my property, but we all have to be careful because there are introduced uh, fungal and insect pests in our area. So if you have uh, tree trimmings and things like that on site and your trees are diseased, don't use them. It's unfortunate, but you should really not even chip them. You should just send them to uh, disposal so that you're not spreading disease throughout your area. So, um, so that's something you'll wanna think about. Um, I see a, a chat room suggestion, untreated lumber and coated it with flaxseed oil. That does help. Um, I've done the same thing. So there are a number of treatments that are not gonna be problematic for you. Um, the other thing I have seen people do is take treated lumber, and again, it's kind of a risk assessment, but put uh, cloth in between the lumber and your soil. That's adding to your expense and um, you know, and then you've got because you have to invest in the cloth to actually buffer that, and then over time it will wear down and it affects your drainage. So, you know, by and large, untreated lumber works best. I can tell you because I support capital projects, the amount of untreated lumber that goes from construction to the landfill is phenomenal, and we have a lot of construction in our area. So if you can find one of these diversion programs, they are great sources of untreated lumber, so you don't have to buy it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I know that there's a couple um, permaculture programs out there that will actually use uh, logs as well, upright logs for the um, border of a raised garden bed. Uh, if you're going to do that, you're going to want to make sure and, and use, again, um, coniferous or evergreen wood um, because that breaks down a lot slower. We also have some other questions about uh, keeping the bad backyard habitat wildlife out of your bed. Uh, for example, deer I've seen or wild rabbits. Do you have any tips on keeping those animals away? I have a, a tip that's um, it's an organic practice that works sometimes, uh, not all the time, but um, blood meal and cayenne pepper powder uh, is one way to deter rabbits. Uh, they don't like the taste of the cayenne pepper powder and they don't like the smell of the blood meal. Um, you can also use chicken wire fencing and wrap it around the border of your raised garden bed to add an extra height layer to it as well. Um, deer are tricky because they can jump so high, um, but rabbits are much easier to uh, prevent. Um, and I can add a couple things. If you use chicken wire, dig it under a mm -hmm. little bit because uh, rabbits will push it to try to get through. The thing with deer is they don't like to jump into things that are too confined. 
right? So if you've got like, a, you would have to put like almost uh, rooms of fencing, but if they're too small, they're not gonna wanna jump in because they think they're gonna get trapped. So I've seen people kind of cross fence in their garden and that's effectively kept them from jumping fences. And of course, if they're high enough, it's usually not a problem. Um, there's a, uh, I've gotten plant skid from the conservation district. So there are a lot of kind of oil-based substances that you can mix that cayenne pepper in. That's been very successful for me. You can get hot pepper in bulk at Costco um, and other places. And it has actually been very successful for me. So I'd support Joe on that one for sure. Nice. Okay. There's another question, and I've seen them used, but whether or not you could um, safely plant in tires. Yeah, um, people do do that. Here's the thing, all tires are not made the same. In fact, we had marine projects here where they were trying to make artificial reefs with tires. And down in Tacoma, they used the wrong type of tire and it leached toxins. And the only thing that would grow on it were invasive species. Um, so it's something that I know people do. Um, I used to feed my horses out of tractor tires, um, but I generally don't. I have non-edibles growing in tires because they do help um, as planters, but I don't grow edibles in them because I'm just not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think just the, the risk isn't worth the reward and and although diverting waste from uh, the waste stream is great in certain situations like that, uh, you just don't wanna risk your personal health. We have another question about using, if anyone has experience using a soil heating cable in their raised garden beds or a soil heating cable and raised bed inside an unseated greenhouse during the fall or winter gardening. Hmm. I don't have personal experience with that. I'm, I'm definitely interested in looking into that more myself i yeah i wish i knew more about that it sounds interesting and uh you know when i go out on site visits and i don't have an exact answer for someone uh, we also have connections with all kinds of great local partnerships like the local master gardeners program um, we have a, a database full of all kinds of educational information that you know sometimes i'll, I'll go on a site visit and not know an answer i'll research um, the information that we have available at our fingertips and, and get back to folks and learn something myself in the process. There is another question again, really about um, if you can start the seeds inside and then when you should put them outside, is there a process for taking them from an inside nice warm safe place and putting them in your garden bed? You know, there's something called um, hardening off the transplants. Uh, it's something that reduces transplant shock. It really depends on the plant variety. It depends on your planting zone. Um, but I would look up the, the term hardening off for vegetable transplants. Um, and that'll give you more information about if it pertains to your specific vegetable variety. Um, but something that is pretty common is transplant shock where you, you put it too quickly from indoors to outdoors and it's going to um, you know, as it says in the name, it's not going to really adapt like it needs to and it'll it'll perish quickly uh, because the adjustment from indoors to outdoors is too extreme. And then another one that came up earlier, but now that we're, when would you start to uh, sow your winter vegetables? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Again, it, it does depend on the vegetable variety and the planting zone you're in. Um, so some of our follow-up resources will help you find out what the site-specific um, selection of, of plants and your, uh, your planting zone will determine when that is. Um, so it really just depends on all these different variables that, that we can provide you in our resource page. Uh, a lot of it has to do with when the typical frost will end for your area. Um, you know, of course, a lot of plants can't handle a heavy frost and, um, you know, with, with uh, climate change, it's becoming more and more unpredictable, unfortunately, to know when the last frost will take place. Um, so it's good to just research what makes sense for your specific location and the specific uh, vegetable variety. 
Um, but if you want to send us an email with the specific uh, vegetable options that you're considering and your location, we can make sure to uh, help you understand more about what would work well in the approximate time frame. And the, the comment I can make, I know we had people with large yards on this, you end up with like what are basically microclimates on your own property. So for instance, I can grow tomatoes in pots. So I'm in an area without a lot of pavement and we are 10 degrees cooler than Seattle on any given day, right? And we're cooler than ever because we don't have reflection from pavement. I have a concrete pad by my barn so I can grow tomatoes on that concrete pad earlier because they're warmer. If I put them out back, they're more at risk where they're just out on the cooler soil in the cooler part of my property. So when we talked about, Joe was talking about just kind of making observations about your property, that's super helpful um, to do when you're thinking about your plants because you may have a little bit of an edge where you have some reflected sun and heat that you don't have in other locations. One question I also, from the chat that I saw, was whether or not there are efforts to have city-supported garden allotments. And I, I live in Everett, and I know that some of the neighborhoods have their own community gardens. And I think it's, as Joe would probably agree with me, it's very easy to start a garden. It's very difficult to maintain over time because you need volunteers that are doing that and just kind of a dedicated team of folks. I have to wonder though with the new world that we're in and that that desire to have local food if um, it what maybe is happening out there that's different this year in terms of community gardens. Joe do you have any thoughts on that? Well um, you know one of the, the resources that we are providing folks um, that we're following up with them on includes a great uh, document from the Pierce Conservation District uh, down south closer to Tacoma where they list all kinds of um, questions that you should be able to answer prior to starting a community garden. And they go in more detail into what kind of maintenance questions you should be able to answer before uh, starting this whole process. Um, so it's a really great piece of uh, information that I send out to folks all the time and I utilize myself. Um, and yeah, it just depends on, you know, you got to look long term. Um, luckily, you know, raised garden beds and uh, community garden spaces are somewhat uh, easy to uninstall if you need to, but you don't want to have to do that. And so uh, making sure that you have a long-term answer to maintenance is, is pretty key. Uh, does that kind of address the question? Yeah, I think so. There's, there's definitely more to come. There's a few other questions. Kristen and I are sort of looking at the ones left in the question and answer box because they're slightly different. Um, but this will be the end before we sign off. But um, how do you prevent rotting or encourage good drainage in these boxes? Yeah, so you're going to want to drill, um, you know, if you're using a metal horse trough, uh, you're going to want to uh, make sure that holes are drilled in the bottom. Oftentimes, uh, folks with uh, raised garden beds will have PVC piping coming up from the bottom down into uh, the soil to make sure that there's adequate drainage. You for sure don't want to have a non-permeable surface at the bottom of the raised bed um, because then it's obviously going to build up moisture over time and so you want to have a, a preventative layer for weeds like chicken wire but you do not want to have it be completely uh, a complete barrier with no ability to move moisture around. Let's see one other question that came through earlier tied to the rain barrels and this may be a good one to send to uh, David but why is algae a problem in a uh, rain barrel why would you not want that in your water source? Sure so we have um, some documents that we'll be able to post to our Snowbush Conservation District website shortly mm -hmm. um, with more details on the safety aspects of using water from rain barrels and totes for vegetable gardens and uh, even for some farm animals. Um, a good example of why algae can be bad is because if you're feeding your horses, they can get sick from certain varieties of algae building up in the barrels and you just want to keep in mind, you know, the, the complete picture of, uh, you know, all the, the wildlife and animals that you're maybe on your farm and, and you obviously don't want them to get sick. So there's certain algae varieties that are going to be harmful. All right, let's see, and one last question. Is there any problem with planting a different type of tree 
where a diseased birch uh, tree was previously grown? Uh, that you'll want to check. So like if you're in Washington State, we have WSU Extension and they can give you some advice on what you can plant after you remove a diseased tree. Um, in our area, Doug Furs and Hemlocks can get a root rot. Once you get it, it takes 15 to 20 years to get it out of the soil, but they can, remember, they can recommend replacement varieties for those trees so that you, even though the organism may still be there, it won't affect the new tree. And then yeah, that's great. And I just wanted to say something too about uh, the allotments question. I'm learning something myself. I, I do recall that allotments are slightly different than community gardens as it's been pointed out here. Um, we work with uh, the Volunteers of America organizations in Snohomish County who has a, a farm called Red Barn uh, Community Farm in South Everett. And they have uh, what I assume are allotments uh, based on this definition here uh, where folks can rent out plots um, so it's different than a community garden from what I understand, but uh, I know there's folks that are in that I work with and who are on this panel who may be more knowledgeable than uh, myself on the allotment definition and we'd love to follow up with you with more information uh, about that. And one last question that came in earlier, probably when you're covering fertilizers and um, the nutrients in the ground, uh, Joe, was somebody asked, what do you think of Milo Organite fertilizer? And I don't know if that's a specific brand um, or not. It is a commercial brand. I looked it up when that came across. Hmm. Yeah, Monica, maybe you can answer that better than myself then. I'm not uh, super familiar. I'm not familiar with it either, and as a county government, we're in the same position as you where we can't promote commercial brands, so I can't, um, you know, I can't comment on it. But I think one of the things is to uh, do a lot of research uh, on what you use for organic. Um, somebody asked earlier, is miracle Grow organic? All commercial companies have different types of products. Um, as we mentioned, we actually, uh, our biosolids go into both farms, forests, and then we have a different level of biosolids that can be used on gardens. So does Tacoma, Tagro is a product. There is a tremendous amount of information on the web and Kristen can get you that information um, on compost that come from, or products that come that are commercial, what the rating systems are, how everything's evaluated, and cross comparisons of different types of things. Perfect. With that, we would like to say thank you so much for being here today. I know it's raining, which makes it easier to be inside. <laughs> um, but now your weeds will come out of the ground really easy this afternoon. So I, my thanks to Kristen and to Monica and Joe and to all of you for showing up today. Any last thoughts, Joe, Monica, Kristen? Um, I was just going to let people know that um, shortly after this class, I will be sending out an email with a PDF of a bunch of different um, links to resources that we mentioned. Um, and also in the email, I'll include a link to a very short survey about this class that we would love to hear feedback on. Um, since this is our first time doing this, we'd love to know how we can make it better. Um, and then next week, probably, um, we'll be posting this presentation online. So I'll send out another email um, to give you the link for that as well. So yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Um, what a great turnout. This was a really fun experience for us. Hope it was for you too. Yeah, and definitely be in touch. We're all available to give you a hand to get started. Um, so be in touch afterwards. So this isn't the end. Um, this is just today's conversation. Yeah, and everyone be safe and be well. Have a great weekend. Very good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for your time and uh, tuning in. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>